Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Saturday webinar for December 4th, 2021. This was the last in our five-episode series on the American presidency, and today we focused on the modern presidency. We were joined by Dr. Jeremy Bailey of the University of Oklahoma and Dr. Jordan Cash of Baylor University. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for another Teaching American History webinar. This is the last in our five-episode series about the American presidency for the fall of uh, 2021 and the last Saturday webinar for 2021. I'm Jeremy Gipton, one of the teacher program managers for Teaching American History, and today I'm standing in for Dr. Chris Burkett, professor of political science at Ashland University, who unfortunately is sick and there, thus can't serve as our, as our moderator as he normally does. We obviously wish him a speedy recovery, and we will see him next month. Um, as I said, this is the last in our, uh, our fall series of Saturday webinars, and it is the capstone on our American presidency series. Today's focus is on the modern presidency, and for that we have a selection of documents, uh, suggested readings ranging from 1789 to 1971. Um, we're fortunate to be joined by two uh, excellent academics uh, with a deep amount of experience and some really great thoughts and ideas about this topic. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Bailey of the University of Oklahoma and Norman and uh, Dr. Jordan Cash of Baylor University. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit of, uh, little bit of an idea about your academic uh, background, interests and, uh, and work. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, some of you, um probably know me. Um, I've been working with Ashbrook for, for, for a while, and I've uh, just left the University of Houston to take a position at the University of Oklahoma, where I am the director of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. And uh, my work has long been on uh, both the political thought of the early republic, as well as uh, executive power questions. And I worked with Ashbrook to put together the document volume from which uh, all of our documents today are taken. Excellent. Excellent. And so, uh, Jordan, I, I, I understand, I mean, I know you're at, you're at uh, Baylor University, and I also understand that you are in the process of writing a book about this very topic. So if you could give us a little bit of a background on yourself and, and tell us about that book and maybe give us an idea as to when it might be available. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is my first Ashbrook webinar, so I'm very excited to be here for the first time and to participate in this. Longtime uh, user of Teaching American History materials, so glad to finally be able to give back uh, to a certain degree. So yeah, I've got a book that I'm working on. It kind of grew out of my dissertation looking at what I call the isolated presidents, or presidents who were unelected, uh, had divided government and opposition from their political parties, making the argument that the Constitution actually creates a powerful presidency. And we'll talk a little bit more about this today, this common idea that the presidency only became powerful in the 1930s. And my book would say, well, that's not necessarily the case. And that even with these, un these isolated presidents who had nothing but their constitutional authority to rely on, there's still quite a bit of power, quite a bit of agency that presidents can use to accomplish their policy goals. Uh, it's right now under contract with Oxford University Press. So kind of in the final round of edits, and hopefully it will come out, let's see, sometime, I'm trying to remember the timeline that they gave me. I guess it kind of depends on how fast I can do the edits, but the, ideally sometime in 2023. So we're, which, you know, considering I've been working on this for several years, actually seems well, pretty close to me. So. In, in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to say, it should come out next year. Yes, we're working on that. So Cheating a little it was on a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, it will. Well, that's excellent. That sounds like an interesting uh, uh, addition to this overall discussion. And so uh, really quickly, things about uh, some of the, the, the functional uh, details of this program. I've, churned, I've turned off the chat function within Zoom, so the chat's not going to work for anybody. If you have questions that you would like me to ask of the panelists, please go ahead and submit those through the Q&A function within Zoom, which should be at the bottom of your screen. It just says Q&A. Uh, go ahead and submit your questions, and I will move through them and, and see how to uh, gracefully, we already have one, that's excellent. Um, so put them through the Q&A. I will do my best to get to as many of them um, as possible. And this program will run until uh, 12.15 Eastern time. So it's a 75-minute program. Um, and uh, we hope to get to 
ideas and words from as many of the four documents as, uh, as have been chosen as possible. And if there are other documents or books mentioned, I'll do my best to write those down and add those to the, um, to the archive page. Uh, and in about a week, all of you who are here will receive an email with a link to that, that archive page, which will have the YouTube recording of this and a link to the podcast. Uh, and we'll have obviously all the documents that we had suggested in advance and, uh, and any additional documents or, uh, or secondary readings that, uh, that Jeremy or, or Jordan suggest during the program. And so you all will have that. And you'll all be able to use that moving into the, the future. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to start actually, because this is about the modern presidency. How has this office evolved? What is it now? Where does it seem to be headed? On what is it grounded? Uh, and so I'd like to jump forward actually and start with uh, then Senator Kennedy's 1960, the president's in, presidency in 1960 speech to the National Press Club. Um, and, and just get your reactions and thoughts on how does he define the scope and the and the the grounding of the modern presidency. Either of you can go ahead and, and jump in. Well, I'll go ahead and take this one first. So I think it's interesting when we look at Kennedy's speech, how and I think he's one of the first people at the presidential level. Granted, he's a senator at this time, so he just for some context. He just announced his presidential campaign a couple of days before he gives this speech. So he seems to be laying out that this is his vision: elect Kennedy, and this is the kind of presidency you'll get. But it's interesting the way he does frame it. He does, he begins with these series of uh, comparisons. So if we look at it, we'd be Woodrow Wilson or Warren G. Harding. We'd be a Lincoln or a Buchanan. And he does this kind of pairing of the implied suggestion is we can either be an energetic, strong president, a Lincoln, a, a Theodore Roosevelt, a Woodrow Wilson, or you can be a weak president, a James Buchanan, William Howard Taft. Uh, Warren G. Harding. And of course, Kennedy's not the first one to do that. There's a, another document, I believe, on teaching American history, Theodore Roosevelt's autobiography, where he does a very similar thing. But Kennedy is the first one in kind of the modern era, post-World War II, to make this distinction that there are two camps, two ways to view the presidency. And you can either be this energetic president or the more deferential President. Yet when he goes through it, and of course he's putting himself in, he's going to be energetic. He accuses Eisenhower of being very uh, lax in his use of executive power. But as he goes through it, when Kennedy talks about the kind of involves to the president being a legislative leader, what has always struck me about it is he doesn't sound that different from some of the founders that who talk about the presidency. So in his discussion of being an energetic executive, being willing to use executive power. Well, Hamilton talks about that back in the Federalist Papers and Federalist 70 in particular. So what's always struck me about this distinction between the modern and the traditional presidency is that there is some continuity that even modern presidents like Kennedy might miss, that in setting up this dichotomy, they might actually be understating the degree to which the presidency was always set up to be fairly energetic um, and that this dichotomy may not be as strong as people like Kennedy make it out to be initially. All right, uh, let me, um, that, that's a, a lot of great stuff that, that uh, Jordan just gave us. Um, first of all, let me say something about the document itself. I was not aware of this document uh, before I, uh, wrote this volume. Um, I proposed a list of documents, and Ash Brook did a very good job in, in contacting two readers to, to look over my list and see if they were appropriate. And uh, some of the readers quibbled about some of my choices and uh, didn't like some, and they uh, had some suggestions for new ones, but the very best suggestion was, was, was this one. I believe it probably came from Steve Knott, would be my guess. Uh, so thank you, Steve Knott. Um, um, but I had, not, I had not known this document, had known about this document. It's not in the standard collections. You don't, I don't, I haven't seen it referenced all that often. Uh, maybe there's a stray quotation or two in, in textbooks that I just didn't know where it was coming from. Uh, but I, I just had never really like read the document itself. And it was actually, um, 
available like through the Kennedy Library archives or something like this. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, sort of readily available. But anyway, it's great. It's 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 a really wonderful mid-century uh, statement of the notion that there is and needs to be a modern presidency. So that, that's the that's the first thing I would I would say about it. Second thing is I think Jordan's done a really nice job of inviting us to think about this phrase modern presidency. I think um, as teachers of the presidency, there's um, you know almost 60 people in this in this room. Uh, we all I think maybe reach for this concept uh, a bit too quickly. It's available in our textbooks, and as a teaching tool, it really does. Um, help students understand the differences, uh, maybe post New Deal or post progressives, post -war, war, World War II, depending on what, on what your cut date is, uh, to, to compare, uh, say the 18th and 19th century presidency versus the 20th century presidency. And Jordan has, has I think, challenged us about, about that uh, definition. And so that's something that we should, um, I think, keep in front of us and, uh, as, as we keep the discussion going. And that is as teachers, to what extent is this concept of modern presidency useful? You know, how much does it reveal about the presidency? And then how much does it actually confuse? How much does it actually obscure? Um, and so um, that's something I, as a theme for our conversation, I think we, we should um, notice. Let me point to a paragraph in the document that I think is really uh, just uh, remarkable. And this is towards the beginning of the document. So it's really like the fifth or sixth paragraph. Uh, and this is his uh, explanation of Eisenhower, the American people in 1952 and 1956 may have well preferred this detached, limited concept of the presidency after 20 years of fast moving creative presidential rule. Perhaps historians will regard this as necessarily one of the, those frequent periods of consolidation, a time to draw breath to recoup our national energy. So, so maybe, maybe there's a time in which the Eisenhower, but JFK sees as, as the Eisenhower presidency. I, th I, think, I think it's an open question whether or not JFK was right about Eisenhower, but that, that's a different question. But, 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 but JFK says, look, maybe, maybe I, this limited notion of, that Eisenhower had was, was appropriate and maybe it actually fit the national mood. But next question, next paragraph. The question is what do the times and the people demand for the next four years in the White House? Now take a look at these sentences. They demand a vigorous proponent of the national interest, not a passive broker of conflicting for conflicting private interest. So here we have the vision of the president as uniquely capable of understanding the nation. Congress is simply a um, body of advocates for different parts, for different interests. So, so, so Congress is unable to see the nation. They demand a, a man capable of acting as the commander in chief of the Grand Alliance. Um, so it's not only commander in chief, but there's some sort of international uh, component to this commander in chief uh, aspect. Not merely a bookkeeper who feels that his work is done when the numbers on the balance sheet come out even. And then check this sentence out. They demand that he be the head of a responsible party, not rise so far above politics as to be invisible. A man who will formulate and fight for legislative policies, not be a casual bystander to the legislative process. Which means that Kennedy expects the president to be partisan. So we both have, have um, the president as a proponent of the national interest but by way of being the head and the cheerleader for a party that is responsible to a particular vision of the national interest, not a broker between partisans fighting that out. Um, to me, that's a really, really uh, uh, interesting way to think about it. And it's also, I think, maybe an interesting way to, to begin our conversation about um, what is this thing called the modern presidency? Yes. It's interesting because you know I, I hadn't seen this this document before either, and I'm I'm really glad that you included it in the um, <clears throat> in the the collection. I like it when we have this is readily accessible language, and it's from Kennedy. I mean, there isn't an American history or American government teacher out there who is not going to have Kennedy play some role in their their courses. Uh, it, those paragraphs, it's interesting, strike me in some ways as distinctly Wilsonian uh, in in his 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 view of 
the the president being this active, uh, this actor, uh, this leader. Um, how much daylight do you see between his ideas here and, say, Teddy Roosevelt? Um, how much of a gap? I mean, I, I think it's always the, um, and I'm not trying to be cynical here, but it seems like it's it's always the uh, the desire of the um, the would be president to establish himself as being something new, something distinctly new and novel and unique and for the future and not, and how the past is somehow um, the idea of like, you know, Eisenhower just sitting on his thumbs while, while the, while, you know, the country goes by um, seems to me like a bit of a false argument. And, and I know that there were, we've seen that plenty of times from, uh, from political candidates, but yeah, how much, how much daylight do you see between him and these ideas and someone like Roosevelt or Wilson? Uh, and how much of this is maybe unexamined um, electoral rhetoric? Or does he really believe, do we think he really believes that, no, Eisenhower is just a, was just a bookkeeper, in effect? So go ahead, Jordan. Sure. Well, to the first question, how much daylight is there between Kennedy and say Roosevelt and Wilson. I think Jeremy's point is a really good one that of Kennedy presenting the president as not only a national representative, but as a partisan representative. I mean, if you look back at Theodore Roosevelt, whenever he would talk, well, as we may know, Theodore Roosevelt tried to run for a non-consecutive term in 1912 as a Republican. He didn't get the nomination, so he broke and ran as a progressive. Theodore Roosevelt was not a big advocate of political parties. He seem to be on the side of progressivism that advocated for a kind of nonpartisanship uh, that hopefully parties would kind of dwindle away and we'd all work for the national interest. So to the extent that Kennedy acknowledges and points to the president's partisan political role in addition to the national interest, I think that is something that Roosevelt Theodore Roosevelt wouldn't have quite have embraced. Woodrow Wilson, a little bit different since Wilson did see parties as a way to kind of bring the presidency and Congress together. Um, there are various places in Wilson, uh, his book, The New Freedom, for example, um, where Wilson says, well, the separation of powers, it's kind of antiquated. We should collapse it and parties can be a method by which we do that. So. To that extent, I think Kennedy might be closer to Wilson, at least in acknowledging parties. But even there, Wilson, I think, would have embraced party government as, you know, we just got to get the whole party in there and then we can run it kind of like a parliamentary system. Kennedy, at least here, strikes me as a bit more realistic that you can't just expect the party to push through everything. Um, but it does seem that like Kennedy's drawn more from that Wilsonian national representative, still with the partisan interest. Uh, so yeah, I, but I do think it's different in a way. And I think one notable thing, so this, what Jeremy pointed out of not a moderator of competing interests, because sometimes we'll hear in the literature about, oh, there's pluralism or pluralistic politics that develops in the New Deal in the 1930s and 40s. And even the 60s, it's just all these competing interest groups. Yet Kennedy trying to transcend that is something that I hadn't really considered before. And I'll need to give it a bit more thought. But it does push back against this idea that I think you see with FDR. Um, so there's a book that came out around 1960 by Richard Newstead called Presidential Power, where he really praises FDR for being able to persuade these different factions, these different interests to do various things. So the fact that Kennedy is saying, no, we need to transcend those pluralistic interests, I think is an excellent point and points to Kennedy perhaps going beyond what even modern political scientists or pol political scientists at the time we're thinking that modern presidents did. So he might actually be tapping into something older, although I'll be a Wilsonian to a degree. Um, yeah, um, what, what, one thing that I, I uh, 
that, that maybe a couple of things that, that maybe help help um, clear 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 some of this up is um, so first of all just on the on the Eisenhower question we, we should just state what 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 uh, both Jordan and I are alluding to is a famous book uh, by Fred Greenstein uh, who uh, it's called the Hidden Hand Presidency it's an account of how how Eisenhower actually was a pretty um, impressive leader uh, behind the scenes. Uh, it's just that he he had different leadership style, uh, and this is in some ways a response to this book uh, that Cash uh, mentioned, that Jordan mentioned, which is the most influential book in the 20th century on the presidency, and that's Richard Neustadt's Presidential Power, which was basically praising uh, FDR and Kennedy and criticizing Truman and Eisenhower for um, ineffective theories of leadership. Um, so there, that's that's uh, uh, sort of in the background. On the, the the party leadership question, I think it's probably also useful to point out that in the early 1950s, this phrase "responsible party government" emerges. Um, it happens uh, by way of a report the American Political Science Association, I think, seeps into uh, broader language. I believe this is what Kennedy has in mind. Because there's a theoretical problem, and the problem is, is how can the Democrats run as a majority party, which they are, by, by a wide margin nationally in terms of registration advantage that continues way up until almost 2000, uh, or even, even lingers beyond 2000, but how can, how can they govern if um, a large chunk of those registered Democrats are actually conservative Democrats in the South? Um, and so they get elected the leadership, but they can't govern responsibly because they don't stand for a coherent set of policies. And so uh, the idea of a responsible party uh, is a party that would be able to govern because it's clear with respect to what it actually uh, runs about. So that party would be responsive in some way. By the way, let me uh, just note to our attention another document way back in 1789, in his speech on removal power, Madison uses the word responsible and responsibility quite a bit in sorting out that constitutional puzzle. And so I think it's an interesting indication of this um, otherwise pre-modern uh, resource that um, perhaps arguably could be latent in the 1780s and 1790s that is to the American founders that, you know, language about the modern presidency doesn't necessarily catch. So we can, we can start to pivot there if we like. Um, but um, back to Wilson, I think Jordan's absolutely right that um, there is something more Wilsonian in this reliance on party than there is in other strands of progressive thought. Uh, that's a reminder that progressive thought is not unified. Uh, but let me state it this way. An interesting question for me in this document is to what extent does Kennedy believe the modern presidency is new? To what extent does he believe it's actually always been there? And it's just a matter of whether or not the president in question reaches out to use it. And so, uh, for example, the conclusion, Lincoln did not tremble when he signed that uh, proclamation. You know, Lincoln's not a 20th century president. And so the way that some, some question is that does Kennedy, and I think this is true of Woodrow Wilson as well, actually believe that uh, what the progressives see in the presidency is not necessarily an innovation or repudiation, but is, but is rather latent in the document itself. Uh, that, 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 that's, a, I think, a puzzle about progressive thought that's not our subject today, but, but, but I wanted to, to call that to your attention in part because this, this phrase modern is one of the things we're trying to sort out uh, right now. Bring, you, know, you, you bring up this document from Madison, and, and before, if we're going to jump to that, you know, fine, obviously, um, but that brings up the issue of you know, the founding and, and, to me, the Constitution. And actually, a question that was just asked from one of our attendees, um, you know, where in the Constitution do you see Kennedy's conception of the presidency? We, we, not, not necessarily in other founding documents, but in the Constitution itself. And specifically, we have a question about executive orders. And this, the conception, whether accurate or not, that presidents have increasingly, especially in the last few decades, used executive orders as a means to legislate rather than having the legislature do its proper 
job. Um, where do you see that um, as an like an evolutionary issue? Where do you see that in the Constitution, and and you know how does that how does that play a role here in the, the modern presidency? So I'll take that first. Um, so first of all, executive orders broadly um, are necessarily. Uh, are necessary in the constitutional order itself. If we think broadly what an executive order is, uh, hey, you, Secretary of Defense, um, go do this in order to prepare for this kind of military engagement. That's an executive order. It doesn't matter if it's written on a napkin or uh, an email or, or something that's codified as an executive order. Um, so, so, so at the theoretical level, it's, it's, it's kind of necessary in the nature of, of command. The president can't do everything himself. He has to give orders to others. Now, in the 20th century, they take on new life post-New Deal because of something that's not as, as clearly in the constitutional tradition, and that's the, the problem of delegation, and that is Congress delegates authority to the president to or to the executive branch to make rules about things that Congress used to make rules about. Uh, what does it require to have clean air? What is it require to have clean water? Uh, what is fair trade? And so and to some extent, they delegate this power to independent agencies. In other respects, they delegate power to the president to tell, tell those agencies what, what those orders are going to be. And so my view of this is, is that to answer the question very quickly, and we'll see what Jordan thinks, um, is that yes, there's been a dramatic escalation. I, I've uh, spent time doing a quantitative uh, codification of executive orders and proclamations. So yes, there's been a dramatic escalation. Um, and um, we see in our own politics how important they become because in divided government, it's very hard to get anything done. Uh, so therefore, an executive order becomes the de facto way to move the ball down the field um, or move it backward down the field, depending on, on you know, which, which president has, has uh, controlled the White House or which party. But the, ulti the ultimate clarity about executive orders is that to the extent that there are problems to be solved, they can be fixed really easily by Congress simply passing a law. Right. And so, for example, uh, I saw this morning that um, Joe Manchin is considering joining Republicans to um, pass some sort of resolution saying that uh, the Biden administration does not have power to force private companies to have the VAX mandate. Uh, so to the extent that uh, OSHA has the power to have to be delegated power by Congress, to the extent that exists in the silence of the law, Congress can easily fix that question mark by simply writing a law. That's, that's sort of my, my shorthand view of thinking about executive orders as a problem to be solved. Well, they can be solved by a new law. Um, but I'm curious what Jordan thinks. Yeah, and I think that's generated. So to the initial question of where the Constitution, I think Jeremy's right that it, it's in the nature of executive power that presidents need to command. They're assigned to execute the law, but the president's just one person. They can't do everything. So you need those subordinates under them and executive orders in the most basic form are simply that orders to the executive branch. But I think Jeremy brings up a good point about how the growth of executive orders, and I definitely agree that there's been a market increase, especially in the 20th century post New Deal, in executive orders as tools of policy making. And this might get us into a different area of just the growth of administration and the centrality of the growth of administration to what we consider to be the modern presidency, that as you have more, a larger executive branch, more subordinates who have greater discretion in how they execute the law, being delegated rulemaking authority by Congress, that necessarily creates more space for executive orders to do more things, more discretion for the president to order his subordinates to do different things. Um, so I mean, constitutionally speaking, it's kind of the best in clause article two, the president shall possess the executive power. It's kind of the constitutional base of executive orders, but the degree, the kind of elasticity of executive orders as tools of the policymaking does seem to shift depending on really what Congress allows. And I think that's an important thing that we need to keep in mind throughout this whole conversation about the modern presidency is, well, where's Congress? Also, where are the courts? 
because I think to a large degree, what has allowed this change or what we might perceive as the change in the modern presidency is also changed behavior on the part of Congress. Congress either choosing not to do certain things or choosing to allow the executive to do things which maybe Congress wasn't willing to allow 100, 150 years ago. So that might be a question along with the administration, but also keeping in mind, where's Congress in all these conversations? And if we, I know we only have limited time, but we might also need to consider where are the courts through all this as well. But let, let me pause and just note. So we, we, we've, in a way we've, we've talked about two, two aspects of the modern presidency so far. So, so one aspect would be um, in a way political or representative. Uh, to, to what extent is the modern presidency modern because the president represents the American people in a national collectivity in a way that, that, that Congress cannot? Um, and so one, one question is to what extent is that part of the modern presidency? Uh, another, another question would be is to what extent is the president as the um, the uh, manager of the modern uh, administrative state that includes a necessary rulemaking uh, and therefore statutory kind, kind of power or legislative power, I should say, rather, or legislative power. Uh, is, that, is that, to what extent, is that, that a defining feature of the modern presidency? Uh, a third part, which we're not going to talk about today, uh, because it's been talked about in, in prior Saturdays, would be to what extent is foreign policy and, and, the, and the war power um, uh, and the president's dominance uh, there, is, 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 that, is that an aspect of the modern presidency? And I would say that one seems pretty clear, uh, that, that, that there's a clear break around mid-century. I think people can argue about the rationale for the clear break, but, but the fact of the clear break is, is, is pretty, pretty significant, and that is the... In the understanding of presidents and the understanding of the American people, the president controls the war power. Uh, and that wasn't the case 100 years earlier. Um, but Jeremy, are you, you getting questions or? Actually, I, I have a question that mm -hmm. it, it won't drag us back to war powers, which we, we did address in an earlier, um, in an earlier episode uh, this semester. But it does, again, bring up the comparison of Kennedy and, and Teddy Roosevelt. I think it's an interesting one is how far was Roosevelt's and Kennedy's foreign policy different or similar? How, how do they, is there daylight between them, their, their conception of the president's place in foreign policy? That could be one interpretation of it. And then the sorts of things that they did as a, as a function of that, that understanding of the president's place in foreign policy. I have a short answer. I'm not a great student of TR's foreign policy by any means. Uh, just on reflection, I would say that, um, you know, Kennedy's broadly an internationalist. He's broadly a cold warrior. Uh, it's important to remember that in 1960, Kennedy is probably more internationalist, probably more of a cold warrior than Nixon. Uh, the Republican Party had not become the party of, of anti-communism and, and internationalist anti-communism in the same way that the Democrats already were. In, in 1960. Uh, so all these things are, are, are I think, probably important uh, markers, not to say that Kennedy's foreign policy is going to be, I think, thoroughly uh, embedded in the context of, of the Cold War in, in a way that, that, that TR just wouldn't have been able to anticipate. Um, so so that's, that's, a, that's a tough, tough question. Um, I don't know if Jordan has any thoughts on that. Well, I'm glad Jerry was able to bring up Kennedy, because I'm not a great student of Kennedy's foreign policy. I wouldn't say I'm a great student of TR's, but I will say with TR, I think you see a similar shift, kind of that similar to what you might see in executive orders. We kind of do see with Teddy Roosevelt in his Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. So the Monroe Doctrine, just to set the context issued by President James Monroe, basically said that European powers should stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And this is kind of the United States sphere of influence in North and Central and South America. The Monroe Do or Roosevelt corollary to that was basically to say if to take a more active role in Central and South America, particularly. So the context generally was some South American countries weren't 
would take out loans from European powers. They might be unable to pay back those loans. And then, you know, England or Germany or France would send over their Navy and invade and do all sorts of shenanigans. And so Roosevelt said, all right, this is our sphere of influence. If they can't pay it back, the United States will intervene in that country, get you your money, but European powers still need to stay out. So I'm, there is a more international or an expansion of American foreign policy power under TR, um, a projection of American influence. He sends the great white fleet around the world for no other reason than that he can pretty much. Uh, but the other thing too with, F, with uh, I always get the Roosevelt's mixed up with TR, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, is executive agreements. So there are a couple instances where the United States was arranging treaties, the Senate was going too slow in ratifying them. So TR just said, well, we'll call it an executive agreement until the Senate ratifies the treaty. So you could see that as similar to an executive order in that if you allow the president to undertake these actions, he just kind of tells the State Department act like this treaty is in force. The Senate will hopefully ratify it soon and then we'll be able to move on more legally. But that again brings up the thing with the Congress has a role. The Senate could have rejected the treaty, in which case TR would probably have to go back to the drawing board. Um, how that relates to Kennedy, I'm not as, uh, able to say, except for I do think you see a more internationalist approach, probably a more presidency-centered approach to foreign policy but as Jeremy was saying, that seems to just be the trajectory of presidential foreign policy and war making powers, which I think is kind of uh, parallel to the administrative developments that we've been talking about today in terms of the modern presidency. So that'd be my. You know, one, one thing that just, just thinking about the, the, the questions about, about TR and Kennedy, um, sort, of, sort of linking them all together. The question that I that I ask, and I, I would ask of students, um, and we don't have the TR document with us, but but it's in the volume and it's a famous document, and a lot of the teachers here will, will have used it before, is when you read that that famous um, section from the autobiography that talks about the president, the presidency is a, a, a steward of the people, um, and that the power doesn't come, you know, from 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 reading something written on a napkin. Uh, or it's not bound up in a napkin. Um, like that uh, document, JFK's document, my, my question would be is, where is the location of any limits on presidential leadership? So what, what would be the boundaries in JFK's own conception of uh, his, his authority? Uh, which is another way of, of asking, you know, what is the difference between authority and, and leadership. Uh, we get a lot from, from Kennedy about leadership, uh, and rightfully so. Uh, he's a tremendous uh, leader, or, or maybe tremendous leaderly potential. Um, but um, I wonder, you know, how, um, how easy of a, of a translation that, that is into thinking about questions of authority, which would be the rightful or justified or legitimate use of, of, of power, uh, which in our system is, is, is defined by, by a constitution, right? And so, and these questions about, a, 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 you know, the constitutionality of, of the modern presidency, one, one question that I have is, you know, not only defining the word modern, but, but where, where do the architects of the modern presidency understand the limits on, on, on the presidency? I've got a couple of good questions uh, from, from attendees right now, and I'd like to uh, I'd like to preface one of them by going back to the founding. I think there's this there's a there's a there's a topic that's kind of been lurking beneath the waves here for the last bit about th this idea of you know there is this modern presidency, and and that thus implies that there was a pre modern presidency that there is a current conception of what a president can should and is able to do, um, and ought to focus on and. And that implies, obviously, that that is different from something that there once was. And perhaps there were several different, you know, conceptions or understandings of there was a pre-modern and a medieval, I don't know, like different different levels of presidential definition. But I would like to go back to that first document, uh, Madison's remarks on the removal power, and, and use that as a springboard into if there is or was an original understanding at the founding of what the president is 
and would and should do. What is that? Or as Jeremy, as something that you mentioned a bit ago that you, if I'm reading you correctly or heard you correctly, that there are implications of this more energetic president at the founding. Obviously we mentioned Hamilton and that's, that's clear. Is that the same kind of energy that, that, um, that Kennedy uh, talks about? Um, and so, and then this goes off, this, this is tied to this question, is this, in your opinion, which presidential administration was most instrumental in pushing past this old presidency into the modern presidency? So I think it'd be important to nail down, is there an old presidency? And when did the dam break? All right, so jo Jordan's an expert on, on uh, why there wasn't a, a, um, a uh, pre-modern presidency. Uh, so, so let him go first. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And Jerry may disagree with me. This may be a place where we uh, have a little bit of disagreement discussion. But yeah, I would say that there's much more continuity between what is considered the pre-modern and the modern presidency. So I am in a minority, perhaps, of well, a substantial minority, but maybe a minority of political scientists on this point or presidency scholars on this point. But I would say if we look back to the founding, look back to the Federalist Papers, you look back to Madison's argument on the removal power. I think we need to think about what is the purpose of each branch of government, right? So Congress is structured two houses to be deliberative, the lawmaking body. Legislative power is meant to make laws. And so to do that, you want a deliberate body to really think through these laws. Executive power meant to execute the laws. And the way that's described in the Federalist Papers is, okay, you want that person to be energetic. You want them to be able to apply the laws to diverse and particular circumstances. And that may require a bit of discretion. Uh, so if you look in the Constitution, and this is a good thing I think I like to do with my students, um, and which Hamilton and Madison each pointed out at various points in their careers. The vesting clause of Article One: Legislative power shall be put uh, granted to a Congress of the United States. It says legislative power here and granted shall be given to a Congress of the United States. So there's a limit, only the legislative powers within the Constitution. But the executive power, it's simply executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. There's no qualifier of the here and granted, which Hamilton and I think Madison at various points too, seem to suggest, okay, well then whatever is naturally executive, whatever powers are naturally executive seem to be placed in the presidency. And if we think about it too, okay, how would these branches interact? There seems to be a presupposition among the founders that each branch is going to try to pull in more powers to itself, that they'll all seek to expand. And so what keeps each branch within its proper scope are the other branches pushing back on it. So for example, Madison, and I believe it's Federalist 48, says, well, the legislature is going to try to pull everything into its vortex. So you need an independent presidency who can push back on it. Um, we see a similar thing in uh, the explanations for the president's veto. But the president has a veto, so he can push back on Congress, things like that. So keeping in mind those different functions, keeping in mind that there was this expectation that each branch would push itself outward to try to gain more power, I'd say to the degree that there's a pre-modern presidency, well, let me back up, to the degree that there's a modern presidency, it's simply a continuing outgrowth of that function. As I said earlier, as we've expanded the administrative state, as we've has become more, as the United States has become a superpower, giving more potential to American foreign policy because those authorities, administrative authority, foreign policy authority, so these other powers are given to the president, he's, his authority has naturally expanded. So I think it's not so much a clear break as it is the potential for presidential action has just radically expanded in the 20th century. Um, and to that point, most scholars, 
I mean, there are people who point to different presidents. Some will say it's TR, some say it's Woodrow Wilson, but I think the majority of scholars would say if there's a modern presidency, it begins with Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s and the 1940s. And we can look at the uh, document, the report from the Brownlow Committee, because that's often pointed to as, okay, this is the starting point, this change in administrative management, this reorganization of the executive branch, that's kind of where the modern presidency begins because it gives the president a lot more direct authority over his administration. It expands the executive branch. And again, I would say that is kind of in the natural logic of the presidency, that if you expand the potential for discretion, then of course the president's going to use it. So like I said, I see more continuity between a modern and pre-modern presidency, but the scope definitely does expand during the second Roosevelt, FDR's administration. Okay, so I've been, I've been um, urging um, that when we uh, think about this question that we try, try to break down the, the various facets of what we mean by the modern presidency and to provide a little bit of clarity on it. And so in some respects, I think the conventional thesis that the, there's a modern presidency, that it's important and to transform the constitution is absolutely right. Uh, in other respects, I think that it's it's uh, not entirely clear, and I think there's probably more continuity than, than, and I agree with Jordan, that there's more continuity than is typically deserved. I would say that both Jordan and I are probably um, somewhat of outliers in, in, in talking about that, that kind of continuity, not not only among, among sort of mainstream scholarship, but I also say within maybe some of the uh, uh, large community that makes up uh, the teaching American uh, history uh, faculty. Uh, so it's important to, 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 to note that. Um, but but one, one case for continuity would be this uh, document we get from James Madison on the removal power. So let's, let's first of all say what it is. Um, there's a debate in Congress when they're creating the State Department. And when they're creating the State Department, the question comes up, well, who has to fire the, who gets to fire the, the Secretary of State? Well, everybody says the president. But the, the, then the question arises, well, does the president have that power because this law we're making gave it to him, or does the president already have that power under the Constitution? And that just blows things up. Uh, people are totally confused about how to answer that. Now, before we get to the answers, we notice that this is before political parties. This is before Hamilton's assumption plan, which is the, the earliest, I, I would say, birth. It would be the conception of, 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 the, of the party opposition. This is uh, June of 1789. This is precisely the same moment that they're debating the Bill of Rights. In fact, this debate is cool because you can go back and forth. Uh, in the mornings, they're talking about the removal power. In the afternoons, the First Amendment, or vice versa. Um, and uh, it's got... Uh, members of the convention there to try to sort out this puzzle. And four camps immediately emerge. Those four camps are summarized in the letter to Pendleton, which is also one of those documents. And, and Ma according to Madison's summary, you have those who believe that Congress can delegate it wherever it wants, that uh, removal is by impeachment only, that removal goes in the same way you get it, that is the Senate has to ratify the uh, removal, so this would be the Tenure of Office Act that gets uh, Andrew Johnson, for example. Um, and then finally, uh, that is the president's power under the Constitution. And the president's position wins narrowly. Uh, I believe there's a tie-break vote in the Senate cast by John Adams, I believe. Um, and it's a narrow victory in the House. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting there just to, to, to see people talking about the presidency before it's a partisan question. Uh, secondly, notice what Madison says, um, just um, like the third paragraph of this document. When we consider the first magistrates to be appointed at present by the suffrages of three millions of people. Well, wait a second. My history books tell me that the Electoral College gets to choose the president, not three million people. Uh, notice that Madison just bypasses the Electoral College in this, in this statement, that the election is going to be a direct election or a more or less or quasi direct election uh, by the suffrages of three million people. Uh, in other words, the Electoral College is not providing a filtering function in this conception. 
Um, so that's the first thing to notice. This is a relatively, uh, we, we know this view is in place by the Jacksonians, but it turns out the view is in place by seven, summer of 1789, by James Madison, no less. Uh, so he uses this point to say that we're gonna get pretty good presidents. Uh, so we have a pretty good system with all the infirmities incident to a popular election. Whoa, wait a minute. There we have again, we have a popular election. I think we may fairly calculate. Uh, so it's corrected by a particular mode of conducting it. So it has a particular mode of correcting this popular election. So it's a modified popular election. I think we may fairly calculate that the instances will be very rare in which an unworthy man will receive. So we're gonna have good presidents. Uh, also notice this really nice phrase. Um, he will be uh, impeachable for any crime or misdemeanor before the Senate at all times. And then at all events, he's impeachable before the community at large every four years. Really interesting use of this word impeachable, uh, impeachable by the community in terms of uh, the prospect of reelection. Um, I think that's a more, um, you know, sort of in a way capacious understanding of impeachment than, than our own current vocabulary, uh, you know, allows us. Um, next paragraph. It is evidently the intention of the Constitution of the first magistrate should be responsible for the executive department. So far as we do not make the officers or to aid him in the duties of the department responsible to him, that is, for example, if, the, if we require the Senate to approve of his um, removals, he is not responsible to the country. Later, uh, Madison talks about um, there needs to be a chain of dependence connecting the president, the administration, and the people. And so what we see in this really wonderful speech also, by the way, notice in the letter to um, um, Pendleton, number three, describing the, the argument for the Senate, which, by the way, was Hamilton's position. Um, uh, if, he's, uh, if you have to go to the Senate, the end number three, it says, to the Senate from the nature of that institution is was meant after the judiciary, and in some respects, without that exception, to be the most unresponsible branch of the government. So the judiciary is the most unresponsible, the Senate's the next most unresponsible, but in some cases, the Senate's even more unresponsible than judiciary. That's an interesting puzzle that invites uh, interpretation. What are those cases or in what respect? Um, but again, notice this word, and this word I think broadly could be used as responsive, um, though it's complicated. I would say responsive at the time of election would be probably the best way to say it, or so responsible around election time would probably be the best way to understand this word. So that's that one, one point. One other quick point about this, this speech, which is also, I think, worth noting, and that is many of uh, you are no doubt for, familiar with Hamilton's uh, case for the difference from the vesting clauses. Jordan just alluded to it. Hamilton makes this argument in the context of the Pacificus Helvidius debates, where Pacificus, he argues that this difference um, suggests the president has the power to interpret treaties, or that is the declared neutrality. Notice that this argument is made not by Hamilton first, but by Madison first. Madison points to the difference in the vesting clauses in this speech. Uh, and so the argument is, is the president has all of the executive power, save for those that are specifically limited by the Constitution. You read those exceptions strictly. The power to remove is naturally an executive power. It's naturally an executive power, not limited by the Constitution. Therefore, the president has it. Now. Here's the question. Why is it naturally executive? I would argue it's because of this question of responsibility. That the, 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 the president as responsive or responsible by way of this national suffrage of 3 million people is part of the way to make that logical leap about why the power to remove is naturally executive. Um, Anyway, so um, that's the case for continuity, or at least some, some germ of continuity to the idea of the president as representing a national majority. Now, there's other parts of the modern presidency that I think deserve you know, our attention as well. You're on mute. I got an interesting question about the vesting clause. And actually, this is you, you provided a perfect segue for this. Is it, do you see the difference in wording? the vesting clauses, um, Congress versus the executive, based on the idea that maybe Congress would have some level of supremacy over the other branches and therefore would need more 
uh, defined and concrete restraints. What do you think about that? Can I take this one first? Mm -hmm. All right. I wouldn't really see it like that. I think it's more the nature of different kinds of power. So again, if we think of legislative power, it's the power to make laws and really just saying in Article 1, Section 8, the Constitution lists what Congress can do. And then Article Section 9, Article 1, Section 9 lists what Congress can't legislate on. And so I think it's just, we might see it as the Constitution limiting the topics that you can make laws about, limiting the subjects that Congress can legislate on. The implication then being that, oh, what's not legislated on at the national level and what's not banned in Article 1, Section 9, well, that's left to the state. So I think it's just more of specifying that the national government, as Madison says in Federalist 45, will be a government of few and defined powers. That here are the specific things Congress can legislate on. And it's easier to do that with legislation, to say you can only make laws about you know, these particular topics. Executive and judicial power, on the other hand, because they're applying the law, executive is applying the law to a particular circumstance, well, what those circumstances could be is almost undefinable. You know, when, how, you can't predict the kind of situation you might have to apply a law to ahead of time. Maybe after you have that situation, then Congress can go back and say, oh, we probably, that's kind of a loophole, let's fill that in. But I think the founders thought we needed to give the executive flexibility in how they apply the law and we can't just limit the topics that the executive could apply the law to. Same thing with the judiciary. Courts are going to get all sorts of cases that they have to apply the laws to, and those can't really be predicted ahead of time as comprehensively, whereas because the legislature is kind of the first action, you know, making the law in the first place, you can limit the initial topics. So that's how I've always seen those clauses. So yeah, I would I would I would just underline what Jordan said that one explanation is that this is a federalism explanation that is legislative power uh, is carved out between the nation and the states in a very particular and important way based on various compromises in the convention and ratification um, that um, everybody is concerned about a zero sum contest between the two legislative powers. Um, nobody's concerned about a zero sum contest between two executive powers. Uh, that's, that's just not as, I guess you see it in the calling out the militia stuff. Um, but there's a kind of federative power, foreign policy power, foreign policy power that the president has, the governors are not going to have that. So there's not going to, not going to be a, a big, big conflict. Um, second part is that executive power is of a seven, uh, answer would be the executive power is a different kind of power, and by definition, it can't be limited in the same way or defined in advance in the same way the legislative power can be. Um, that executive power is necessarily um, uh, unruly or ungovernable, um, and therefore can't be defined in advance, um, would be a second explanation. Another explanation would say, look, uh, this would be the sort of the counter view, and this has been around since 1788, all the way up until, you know, there are three members on our, or two members on our Supreme Court who believe that, look, you should read Article 2 just like Article 1, and that is that you shouldn't hang everything on the absence of hearing granted, that Article 2, Section 2 lays out the powers the president has, we should read those powers more or less like we read Article 1, Section 8. These are the powers Congress has. And so there's not this big colossal difference. Uh, a similar reading was made by the Whigs, by Webster and Clay. And what they perceived is that the vesting clause argument favoring the president was on a kind of constitutional collision course with the necessary and proper clause. And it was a collision course with who is going to hold, you might say, the residuum of implied powers. And uh, the Whigs wanted Congress to hold that. The Jacksonians wanted the president to hold that. And that, that was a, the, the way that that uh, debate emerged in the, the 1830s. Um, finally, 
a really cool thing on this is Jefferson writes two constitutions for the state of Virginia in 1776 and 1783. And if you watch Jefferson fiddling with the vesting clause, you really see cool stuff. Uh, just very short, 1776 has all these powers that are forbidden. The governor's not gonna have this power, he's not gonna have this power, he's not gonna have this power, all these kingly powers. The 1783 constitution, the governor, uh, the, the model for the governor's powers will neither not be nor be the king, rather the application of this idea must be left to reason. And so, so after several years of experience, Jefferson had encountered the difficulty of defining that which is executive power and therefore the difficulty, and from a constitution maker's perspective, writing something like a vesting clause. This makes me think it, 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 it brings me back to the notion that you, Jordan, especially you laid out earlier that the modern, this idea of the modern presidency being a clean break, like uh, you got on a whole different road and started going a different direction than what was conceived of and, um, and created at the founding, that it is the modern presidency is actually a natural evolutionary um, development of what was established at the founding uh and it's interesting that we throw jefferson into the mix uh and and he he actually during the founding era provides commentary or at least food for thought about that my question is if that let's assume that's so let's assume that that the idea of the modern presidency isn't really something fundamentally different in that it is a natural outgrowth of that which was originally established does that still, does that possibly, the presidency as being one of the three branches, does that, does the modern presidency, even if it's a natural outgrowth, does it still distort the original plan for government being this, this entity that functioned as, a, um, as three branches in concert to some degree? So, so could we have a modern presidency that is founded in the founding, but still is does, does that possibly distort what the government was intended to be as a whole at the founding? Or maybe in the, you know, when we move into the progressive era, we break you know, radically with, um, or with FDR in the latter half of the 20th century. What do you, what do you think about that? Quickly, if you, if, you, if you radically change the definition of national power and what Congress is going to do by regulation, and then Congress gives a large part of that power to the executive branch by way of delegation, then you've got a fundamentally transformed constitutional order because you've got a lot of stuff that the national government's doing that it never did. And now the president or the executive branch is managing it. Uh, I think that would probably be the, 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 the biggest argument for a, a transformation. Yeah, and I would say it's the way I consider because I would, wouldn't say that there's I to be careful to make sure I articulate this properly. I see con a lot of continuity between what we might consider a pre-modern and, and a modern presidency, but I do think there's a change that happens in the 20th century that perhaps allows, allows the underlying maybe logic or incentives that the constitution builds into the executive to go farther than the constitutional order might have been originally intended to permit. I think Jeremy kind of got to that um, with what he just said, that when Congress approaches more national regulation and then delegates all of that to the president and just kind of writes these laws that says, well, we want clean air, clean water, you know, regulate the banks. Oh, and that, you know, the secretary of the interior will Right, that the Secretary of the Treasury will make all needful regulations to do that. That does seem to be a unbalancing of the constitutional order. That con and we might be able to get into this a little bit with uh, some of these actually like Humphrey's executor about how I think we see Congress since the New Deal in particular not legislating in the way that the founders might have intended. 
not being as specific on what the executive is meant to do and how it's meant to do it. And in delegating authority to the executive branch, granting that larger discretion, you know, it's like I said, it's in the logic of the presidency to just say, okay, yeah, sure, I'll seize more of that power. That's to be expected. Basically, when I said earlier that separation of powers is predicated on each branch pushing back against each other, to a certain extent, Congress stopped pushing or stopped pushing very hard. Um, I think that's where we see a lot of this change in the modern presidency, at least administratively, that Congress helped expand the administrative state and that's the shift. So even if the fundamental tra constitutional trajectory remains the same, there is a change that the constitutional order may be more imbalanced than it was, or the executive is doing more than was initially intended. I think that is a change. I've got an interesting question that just came in that th this will this will divert, I think, our direction a little bit. And we've only got about nine minutes left, but I think it's really worth looking at. Um, we're asked, is there any place in this conversation prior to the starting of the modern presidency for the presidencies between Hayes and McKinley? Like, okay, so I saw that question, and uh, let me let me just uh, reveal. So Richard Ellis, who's a presidential scholar I tr tremendously respect, just published a review of my book in American Historical, the American Historical Review, uh, praising the book, but pointing out that I largely skip over this very period. Uh, and then this is a history of, of the idea of president's representation. And Ellis is exact, exactly right. I totally skip the Republican presidents of the late 19th century. Um, and um, so the answer is, I don't know. Uh, uh, or yes, there's something there, but it's not 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 important enough for me to, to, to spend time thinking about. And so the questioner should write a MA thesis or something like that, uh, laying the groundwork uh, for for our, our understanding of it. There there is there is stuff. I mean, there you have you have Grant uh, issuing tons of um, what I call them settle down proclamations to deal with the KKK, for example. There's some stuff uh, I think that Cleveland has to deal with 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 labor uprisings. Uh, sort of sort of domestic insurgency uh, kind of stuff. You certainly have the, um, you know, going a little bit further into the 20th century, the foreign policy is a kind of, you know, unseemly adventuring and imperialism uh, that, that uh, you know, involves, involves the presidency. Um, there's stuff there, absolutely. Um, but um, it's not not uh, as as clearly important. Just to add that one thing I would see, and this gets back again to administration and a little bit to the removal power conversation, albeit indirectly, is you do see with James Garfield, well, actually with Hayes a little bit, and James Garfield in particular. So in the 1870s and 1880s, the Republican Party is divided more or less into two factions: the stalwarts and the half-breeds. And half-breeds supported civil service reform, which mm. would have taken really the control of administrative personnel from you know, the highest political officers all the way down to your postmasters, your port collectors, tax collectors, would have made those the kind of lower level bureaucracy standardized. Um, whereas the stalwarts wanted what we call the patronage system because it was used as a tool of party building. You had people help you in the party, win the presidency, and then you reward them with jobs. It's kind of how it worked. Uh, but with Presidents Hayes, Garfield, up to Chester A. Arthur, you do get these conflicts over administrative appointments. Uh, there's a New York senator named Roscoe Conkling who tried to control patronage in the state of New York and would try to block uh, appointments that he didn't like. And so there's a conflict between him and Hayes and him and Garfield. And Garfield eventually wins because Conklin at one point, I don't quite understand the logic behind this, but he resigned to show he had more power over appointments because he thought he'd get reelected easily and then he didn't. So Garfield kind of just pushed it through. So you do see things like that in this fight over appointments, fight over administration, a... And to a degree, I think you could see the civil service reform as part of that 
trajectory towards a larger administrative state and a more set bureaucracy that then becomes substantiated more in TR and especially in FDR. So there's a little bit there. Like Bailey, though, I'm not a huge expert. I do hope because I have interest in uh, not famous presidents, I do hope to write something on those presidents at some point, but I haven't done quite enough yet. My, my, my buddy and graduate school roommate, Daniel Klinghardt, wrote a really good book on the party system, um, basically um, around the time of Cleveland. Uh, it has more to do with the party system than the presidency, but um, he's, he's, a, he's a real pro on that stuff. I want to, there's a few minutes left, I want to make a plug for the document in the, in the, the volume that is bears on our conversation, if we didn't talk about. That's the debate on the 22nd Amendment. The 22nd Amendment, I think is a really cool one to teach. It's accessible for students and it pushes it, pushes us in direct opposition with Hamilton and Federalist 71 and Federalist 72 um, because it's the, the term limit amendment. And what's really cool is that, so that's the last time we have a constitutional reform really on the presidency that's, that's, that's huge uh, in terms of the structure of the presidency, I, I would argue. And these founders, if you will, did not see their task as one of transformation. Rather, they saw it as, as maintenance. Or to put it differently, both Republicans who are pro-term limit and Democrats who are anti-term limit both cast their arguments in terms of continuity, not change. And that is that nobody said, hey, look, we've got a modern presidency and this is what we got to do. Uh, that our position aligns with it. Both Democrats and Republicans saw their view as compatible with a constitutional presidency. I think that's an interesting snapshot. When, if I could say one more thing similarly to that, in one of the documents you read, the Brownlow Committee Report, it's notable that throughout the report, or at least the way they begin it, is that the founders created this democratic executive that was meant to be able to get things done. And so they phrase their argument as, well, the administration has just become inefficient now in the 1930s. So they portray their reforms, the ones that we often point to as the beginning of the modern presidency, they portray it as, no, this is a way to get back to what the presidency was supposed to be, this energetic, efficient administrative apparatus. So even the ones we might point to as the reformers, the break, are portraying themselves as continuity rather than change. I have one last question from that, that we'll be able to get to. And then I just like some closing remarks from both of you about this, this idea. And I, I'm, I saved this one for last because I think it could be answered quickly, maybe. Uh, it's interesting. And I think it's, a, it's absolutely the type of question that teachers get from students. Um, could a future president overrule Truman's order that desegregated the military? Yes, but it'd be overturned by the by the Supreme Court. Yep. And the president would lose in the next election. So so legally, yes, politically, absolutely not. Like that is he could do it and then it there would be a backlash, it would be overruled and then he would bear the political fallout of that action. I think the Supreme Court would find some legal basis to overturn it. Yeah, or to get back to what we said at the very beginning, Congress could pass a law yeah. just overturning the executive mm -hmm. order, yeah. which I'm sure they would. Yeah. So in our closing moments here, what, um, what suggestions or what ideas do you have for, for teachers who are considering this idea of the presidency and as a subset of it, the modern presidency? What are some parting thoughts that you would uh, impart upon them or suggest Keep thinking about this issue. Keep asking along this line of questioning. What what do you what do you folks have? I, my my advice is to documents based. Read Fed seventy one, Fed seventy two, and then TR versus Taft on the presidency, and then the Kennedy speech, and maybe McGovern Fraser, um, and stu and then students uh, should be able to figure it out. Yeah, how do we documents based? Um, I think focusing on those attributes that we've talked about on the president being energetic as being responsible, the administrative elements of the presidency and kind of tracing through what was the presidency meant to be? Did that change? Has it changed? Does modern presidency accomplish that better? I think 
tracking some of those questions about presidential attributes uh, could be a very interesting and helpful way to look at it. Briefly, another question is, is, is leadership compatible with constitutional government? Interesting. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to tackle that one because it is 15 after the hour. And we, so that, that's great, though. People can chew on that over Christmas break or over the last few weeks of their, their semester. So first off, um, thank you both, Jordan and Jeremy, for a really interesting discussion. Um, I, I feel like we had a lot of questions answered. But I think a good program like this does that and leaves many more questions to ask and a direction in which to go to, uh, to try to tackle them. So thank you both for your efforts today, your suggestions for the documents, and just your input. I, I really I think that this was probably a, a, a good and you know, beneficial program to our, our attendees. Um, folks, those of you who have attended or are here right now, thank you so much for the questions. Um, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get to all of them. We got to most of them. Um, but as is typically the case, we go in depth, and so we, we have to cut uh, some out. So I apologize for that. Um, our next Saturday webinar series begins on January 8th. And like we did this semester, where we had a five-episode series, we're going to do a five-episode series in the spring semester on the populists and progressives. And we're doing it in the kind of the same template. Uh, Dr. Jason Jividen was the editor of our Populists and Progressives volume, which you can download from free, for free from our bookstore. If you go to tah.org and click on bookstore at the top, you can choose the PDF of that volume or any of these volumes, as a matter of fact, including Jeremy's American Presidency volume. You can download that PDF for free. We are going to look at the populists and progressives, and we're going to begin in, on January 8th with what is a progressive. We're going to follow on in successive episodes looking into uh, progressive views and populist views on political economy and the role of the federal government in economic affairs, in campaigns, parties, elections, uh, changing ideas about limited government and separation of powers. And then in May, we will finish the series with a legacy of the progressives episode. So you'll all get an email um, in about within about a week to two weeks, which will enable you to register for all five of those at once. And we'll run through those like we have this semester. And, uh, and then, as I said at the beginning of the program, you'll all get an email in about a week that will have a link to the archive page for this program, which we encourage you to distribute to your, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, post on social media if you think other people could benefit from it. And you'll also be able to then, from that, download your, uh, your certificate, your PDF certificate for the hours of continuing education. Uh, so thanks, teachers, for all you do. Have a terrific uh, rest of your semester these last two weeks. A great Christmas break, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in 2022 online and, and uh, hopefully in person. And Jeremy and, and Jordan, thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our resources, programs, documents, and documents collections at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.